So now that we've talked about the guts of the Roto tool, let's talk a little bit about how you use it. The first big thing is working explicitly and pre-multiplied, and we talked about this in the script organization, and this really applies here as well. So here we're going to look at one of our examples from earlier. We have this face. We're doing some masking operations with it to create this shape. So we have two shapes here. We have our circle, and we're applying a little bit of feather to it to soften the edge. And then we have a second set of shapes where we're creating some features, and then we're actually stenciling out some other features. We're then taking this and stenciling it against our main shape to create this. When you work explicitly, you really want to show the work. And so in this case, I've set this up to be the same thing. And basically, I've now split it into three pieces. So we have our main shape. I'm then using a blur node to create the edge softening effect because I can see that at the node graph level. I don't have to click into the tool and then select that layer to see exactly what's going on. So it's a little faster to make changes. It's also faster to turn it on and off. I then have my other shapes that I'm going to punch out, and I need to put some holes in these as well, so I have that set up again as another shape. Each of these is working additively, and then I'm using masking operations to do the work for me. And I'm doing that explicitly with a merge node. I'm not doing that inside the roto node itself. So here I'm stenciling out that piece, and then I'm taking that whole thing and stenciling it out of the other shape. So this is an example of working explicitly. So here's an example of pre-multiplication. This is a more traditional setup of how Nuke was built to interact with some of these tools. There's some good things and some bad things about it, in my opinion. One is that you can't exactly see what you're doing, or not quite as easily. So here we have a plate of a hand, and then we have a roto of a hand. And what we're doing is our roto comes in default, where we're only inputting an alpha channel, and we're not bringing in an alpha channel from our read node either, which is the default for nuke. And then we're having to use a mat operation on our merge to cut out and put that on top of a background. The problem with this is we can't ever see the hand by itself. Because of the way it's working and it's unpremultiplied, all the pre-multiplication is happening inside that merge, and there's no way to actually see it without putting a blank background in your background, which requires rewiring things a little bit or just toggling things on and off. A more explicit way and a way to work pre-multiplied is you add an alpha to your plate, and then you have your roto shape separately, and then you use a mask operation to take that roto shape and cut it out of your plate. So now we have our hand completely cut out, and you can see our bounding box is now the same size as our, shape, as our roto shape, which gives us a little smaller working area. The computer's having to do a little less work to draw that for us. It also becomes very clear where our edge issues might be. You can see we have some green spilling out here and there. So by doing this, we can work in just this local area and not have to worry about rendering the entire background or everything else that might be connected below this to see the work in, in place. And if you look at these two merged together, back to back, it's doing the exact same thing. This just gives us a little cleaner way to see exactly what's going on. We can also see that this is a mask operation just by the nature of how we've connected it where it's possible a roto shape in line with a read might actually be contributing RGB data and doing something a little different. You know, we don't know that it's a merge operation necessarily, or that it's going to be a masking operation necessarily. Another thing in terms of working explicitly, a roto shape, you can have tons and tons of roto shapes in an individual node. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. You can split each of those out into their own node, and it gives you a little bit more control and a little easier organization. You know, in this case, we've labeled them all, and we can go directly to the shape we want. We can also split them out into groups. Say we want our palm and our arm grouped together because we're going to apply the same blur to both of those nodes. This is a little cleaner because now we can apply those tools per area, and we're not worried too much about having to dig into the tool and make changes that way. This leads us to our next section, which is talking about additive and over. And by additive, again, I don't mean the math. I mean the way that you put things together. But seriously, you should also never plus rotos together. I've seen this many times, and 
on first look, it looks exactly the same as if you looked at you know, one shape or all of your shapes stuck together or with everything just set to merge over. But the problem is when you plus them together, you're adding the alphas as well. So if you actually pull your gain on your viewer down, you can see now we have these areas where our alpha has a higher value and our RGB also has a higher value. If you were doing some, some operations where you might be multiplying or adding things, this could become problematic and you might see matte lines pop up where you have that alpha doubled up. And I've seen shapes where you might have five, six, seven shapes that are all overlapping in one spot. And then you're looking at alpha values and RGB values that might be six, seven, eight, nine, ten, And that can really cause some problems in your comp later. But here's another way to sort of work additively. And you can just glom all of your roto nodes together like this. It becomes a little problematic, say if you wanted to add blur to each of those nodes individually. So what you can do is you can set it up this way. And now, say we want to blur this one and this one with different amounts of blur. We can very easily set that up, manipulate them. We could stack three or four of these together if they're all getting the same blur. The other really nice option working this way is you can very quickly turn off different chunks. You know, so it's, it's really an additive process. So you can really minimize the amount of things you're looking at and just work the important things to you in that moment. So the next big tenet of Roto, we're gonna talk about blocking and the extents of motion. And by extents of motion, I mean sort of the furthest point that something moves before it either moves a different direction or comes back the other way. But first we'll talk about blocking. So we have some footage here. And this is of a very sleepy cat doing some walking. And what we want to do with blocking, we want to really analyze the footage. We want to see what's going on so that we don't get our we don't paint ourselves into a corner later down the road. And I'm going to kind of walk through a little bit of that process and sort of give you some tips on how to set that up. So in this case, I've gone through and I've picked different frames that represent different shapes we might need for this roto. Say we were rotoing this entire cat out. So we obviously want to start at the beginning because that's where we're going to have to have him cut out to start. So you can see each of these lines represents a shape and that shape represents sort of a general area of that object. So in this case, we're looking at it, you know, this will be a head shape. We might also roto the neck. I think we'd probably want this ear separate as his head rotates and the ears disappear and appear. We might want a separate shape for his back, another one for his tail because the tail is probably moving somewhat independently of other parts of him. We'd at least need one shape here for his back leg where it's contacting the ground. And then this four, four leg, we'd probably want two, maybe three shapes here to manage all the different articulation points on that leg. But now as we move through this shot, we'll see now he's actually stepping out with that other leg. We couldn't see that when we initially set it up, but we do need to account for it. So we're gonna maybe create another shape or two to handle this leg. And then again, we're seeing more articulation. This initial shape that we maybe created as one, we might actually need three here. So it's really good to think about that and look at the footage before you just start, because that way you won't, you won't get trapped or you won't have to really force a shape to do something that it's maybe not set up to do. You can also say we have another leg visible now. We're gonna need to create a couple of shapes for that. And this is where that lifetime tab and your lifetime controls are really helpful. You can set this shape up so that it only appears on the frames where it's needed and nowhere else. And by that same token, you don't need the same shape to do the same thing. You know, we're going to see his leg pop out over here as well, but we can use a completely different shape with a completely different lifetime setting. And that might be easier than trying to make this shape that we've built for this particular movement work for another movement. You can see here too, we also have his ear visible. As his head rotated, now we have a second ear. So we need to create another shape for that as well. Here you can see our leg has now passed through the other side and we can see the foreleg coming back. Those are a couple more shapes that we're gonna need to create. And then once again, as this leg passes back through the other side, we're gonna wanna maybe create a couple shapes here as well. 
Lastly, you can see he really stretches and his paws spread. So we might use the shape we've built, but we might need to tack on two or three or four more other ones to help manage some of the more detailed animation that we're gonna need to do. And lastly, this is kind of where we're landing. And these are all the shapes that we're probably gonna wanna have in place when we finish the shot out. So let's talk about extents a little bit. And we can look at this shot real quick. So extents, it's basically the furthest that something goes. A really good example is a walk cycle. At some point, that leg is gonna swing out and then it's gonna start to come back the other way as it touches the ground. And the same as it's moving away. They're gonna, it's gonna stay on the ground until a certain point and then it's gonna pick up and start to move back forward again. When you're animating, you don't wanna animate arbitrarily. You wanna find those furthest out points where the movement stops or changes directions. And I call that the extent of the movement. And in this case, we have a couple different places. So here you can see the hand is wide open. That's the furthest out that that hand opens. And then we have the hand closed down together. And that's the furthest close that hand's gonna be. So we wanna start with our keyframes there. And then we find other areas of movement where it changes, either it accelerates more, decelerates, or maybe there's a little adjustment here or there. But that's the idea, and the, the whole point of blocking and with, you know, really animating to the extents of the motion is to reduce the number of keyframes. The less keyframes we can have, the better. You're going to have a smoother animation. Everything's going to look a little bit better if you can reduce your number of keyframes. You just don't want to go animate every three frames or every five frames. You want to really analyze the motion and put the keyframes in smart places. That also is really important too because your extents might change drastically. In this case, the hand goes from full open to full closed. So where you might have started with a shape like this, where you just have one shape that covers the entire hand, that's gonna get a little bit problematic when you have a full fist and you have to now move each of those fingers into that space. Because what you're functionally gonna have to do is roto, take that roto and shrink it down to match the outside of these knuckles. If each of those fingers is set up as a separate shape, it's really easy to either translate them out of the way or you can use a different shape to capture the knuckles when they're in that form. So here you can see it really gets a little messy where if we use our multiple shapes, these can then get transformed in and out and moved or changed or new ones created entirely to help make that easier to animate. We would just drag here, and maybe that finger just slides out, or we use a separate shape, or we use as many shapes as we need to make it flow cleanly. And again, we, we use that based off how the object is moving. 